Happening now, the FDA and the CDC are announcing brand new details on their decision to unpause the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Let's listen in. And Dr. Ann shook it, the principal deputy director of the CDC. First, we will hear remarks from Dr. Woodcock and then Dr. Walensky. Following their remarks, we will open up for questions. With that, let's turn over the press conference to Dr. Woodcock. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you all for joining us. Today, after an extensive review of the available data, the FDA and CDC are lifting the recommended pause on the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. The pause is recommended due to a limited number of adverse events reported after the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine was administered. These events suggested a potential increase in the risk of blood clots or thrombosis occurring alongside a low platelet count or thrombocytopenia. After a thorough review of all available data, the FDA and CDC have concluded that the possibility of this so-called thrombosis thrombocytopenia syndrome occurring is very low, but the investigation into the level of potential vaccination-related risk will continue to be ongoing. Together, both agencies have full confidence that this vaccine's known and potential benefits outweigh its known and potential risks in individuals 18 years of age and older. Now, this is not a decision the agencies reached lightly. Medical and scientific teams at both the FDA and CDC reviewed several sources of information and data related to the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine to reach today's assessment. Specifically, the agencies examined reports submitted to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System and reviewed currently available medical literature. The agencies also considered the information provided by our global regulatory partners um, with about thrombosis with thrombocytopenia that have been reported following use of a similar but not identical COVID-19 vaccine that is not currently authorized in the United States, which uses a virus from the adenovirus family that has been modified to contain the gene for making a protein from SARS-CoV-2. Considering all these factors, we're confident that the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine meets our robust standards for safety, effectiveness, and quality for a medical product that is used widely, including in healthy individuals. The FDA has updated both the fact sheet for healthcare providers and the fact sheet for recipients and caregivers to include information about the risk of this syndrome, which has occurred in a very small number of people who have received the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. Individuals who have questions about which vaccine is right for them should discuss their options with a healthcare provider. Now, I'd like to turn the press conference over to Dr. Rochelle Walensky, Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, for more information about what we know about these reports and the outcome of today's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Dr. Walensky. Thank you, Dr. Woodcock, and good evening, everyone. Above all else, your health and safety come first. The American public should feel reassured about the safety systems and protocols that we have in place around the COVID-19 vaccines. Our systems help to identify incredibly rare events. We at the CDC and FDA took the time needed to fully investigate this issue. We paused use of the vaccine out of an abundance of caution. Today, after hearing the deliberations of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, CDC, in partnership with FDA, is recommending that administration of the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine resume. To be clear, we are no longer recommending a pause to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I want to thank the ACIP for their work and for presenting their recommendations today, guided by the latest science. I support the ACIP's recommendation that the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine be used for persons 18 years of age or older in the United States population under the FDA's emergency use authorization, and I have signed this recommendation. 
With these actions, the administration of Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine can resume immediately. That said, FDA will add more details to the healthcare provider and patient fact sheet, including information about the risk that events have occurred in a very small number of people who have received the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Additionally, CDC will work with public health authorities to continue to educate the public and healthcare providers about these rare events. The science supports this news, and I know that this is welcome news for many, as many have wanted the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to fill an important need in vaccination efforts here and around the world. I'd like to share some of the details that led to this population-based decision. When examining cases of thrombosis thrombocytopenia syndrome, or TTS, which is a rare and severe type of blood clot with low platelets, we broaden case definition to make sure we were capturing all of the possible cases. We reviewed all of our data from the adverse events reporting system. We confirmed 15 total cases, including the six original confirmed cases. All occurred in females. The age ranged from 18 to 59 with a median age of 37. Onset of symptoms after vaccination ranged from six to 15 days with a median time of eight days. Outcomes of these 15 women include three deaths, seven remained hospitalized, including four in the ICU, and five have been discharged to home. Based on the in-depth analysis, there is likely an association, but the risk is very low. What we are seeing is the overall rate of events was 1.9 cases per million people. In women 18 to 49 years, there was an approximate seven cases per million. And the risk is even lower in women over the age of 50 at 0.9 cases per million. Over the last week, CDC also conducted a key risk benefit analysis, looking at use of the vaccine, both on a population level and at an individual level. In terms of benefits, we found that for every 1 million doses of this vaccine, the J&J &J vaccine could prevent over 650 hospitalizations and 12 deaths among women aged 18 to 49. And this vaccine could prevent over 4,700 hospitalizations and nearly 600 deaths among women over 50. These are significant numbers and show the important impact of this vaccine in our country. In the end, this vaccine was shown to be safe and effective for the vast majority of people. For some women under the age of 50, there might be an increased risk of this rare TTS condition. We have three safe and effective options for a COVID-19 vaccine in this country. And the J&J &J is an important vaccine offering key advantages, including its single dose option and its viability when the supply chain may not allow for freezers. We are pleased to have resolution today and proud of the millions of Americans who have already gotten the COVID-19 vaccine and are fully protected or are on their way to protection. More are rolling up their sleeves every day. The pause of this vaccine allowed us to ensure that the healthcare providers and additional patients were treated appropriately. Of the additional cases that were reported to the CDC, none of them received heparin likely improving their outcome and demonstrating that our systems worked. I want to encourage everyone to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Vaccination will bring us to the other side of this pandemic. With three COVID-19 vaccines available in this country, as of this week, everyone over the age of 16 is now eligible to get a vaccine. I want to also thank the medical community for reporting cases. I want to thank the ACIP and the FDA for their hard work and the public for their patience as we worked to ensure your safety. We will continue to keep health, safety, and equity at the forefront of everything we do. And we will continue to monitor for any safety concerns related to any of our COVID-19 vaccines. So with that, I will thank you and turn things back over to Dr. Woodcock. Uh, thank you, Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Walensky. At this time, we will begin the question and answer portion of the press conference. 
Please remember to turn your camera on and unmute when asking a question. Our first question comes from John LaPoop at CBS. Mute and turn the camera on. Start the video. There we go. <clears throat> Um, you know, as a practicing physician watching this for the hours over the last few weeks, um, I, you, you can't help but be impressed by the seriousness of thought, the depth of thinking, the care, and you have these world's experts all contributing in an open, transparent way. So personally, I was blown away and I appreciated the part of it, which was educating me, doctors like me, who might actually do the wrong thing and give heparin in this setting because it's not, it, we don't usually see this. So. I think that probably was part of what went into your thinking about making a big deal of this, not just educating the public, but educating us. That said, most Americans did not watch this. Most people didn't get to see the seriousness and how many smart people were all working on this and the risk benefit analysis. So what specifically are you going to do for the inevitable hit on public confidence and perhaps increase in, in hesitancy that this might cause. I mean, you mentioned it, Dr. Walensky, but specifically, are there specific programs? Because we hear like 20% of the American public has said they're not gonna take it ever or only if it's mandated. And the, and the wait and see people went from like 39%, according to the Kaiser study, down to 17% uh, now. So that 17% are the key people if we're gonna get the 75 to 80%. Uh, of herd and, uh, vaccination for herd immunity. So what specifically, how are you gonna go out there and get this word out to the public who didn't sit through the hearings? Well, I think Dr. Walensky is best uh, suited to answer that question. Um, thank you, John, for, for your early comments. We did take this extraordinarily seriously, so I, I appreciate that. But your, your other comments are well taken. So first of all, I wanna convey that we have heard several things. One is that um, people who were thinking about getting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine might have had decreased confidence during the pause, but many of them actually went and got an mRNA vaccine. So it was, it was just that during this pause, they were, they were um, not confident. So, um, and also, as we like talk to governors, talk to other stakeholders, people were really asking to have this back. They wondered why we had paused and they were anxious to have this back, have an opportunity for a single dose vaccine for um, a one and on possibility. Um, but your point is well taken. I think we have to do extraordinary outreach to clinicians as we have been doing this past week. We already have plans to start that on Monday to public health officials. And then we have to do extraordinary outreach to, to patients to meet people where they're at, to educate them. Overall, I actually think that this pause um, conveyed that we are taking every one of these needles and haystacks that we find seriously, and that we're really um, examining, scrutinizing the data that we're seeing. And people have said um, in that context that they've gained confidence in our vaccine safety system. The problem. Oops. Um, our next question comes from Elizabeth Weiss with USA Today. Please turn your camera on and unmute yourself. Okay, thank you so much for taking my call. Um, when will shots resume? You said immediately, could it be tonight? And how will people be notified of the risks? Dr. Marks, would you like to talk about the fact sheets? Sure. So thanks very much. So uh, shortly after uh, this uh, announcement, uh, shots should be able to resume. Um, uh, I would expect them to resume in the not uh, probably by tomorrow morning even. Um, uh, in terms of how we will inform people, we have added information uh, to our fact sheets for patients in plain language and for providers. Um, and actually, as was noted in the last question, uh, the fact sheets for providers provide some education into the recognition of this rare complication and to how to manage it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Peter Loftus with the Wall Street Journal. Please turn your camera on and unmute yourself. Hi, um, I'm wondering 
were there any factors in your minds as you were considering this decision that um, that would have supported continuing the pause? And what were they? And then what was it? What were the other counterfactors that outweighed that and led to what you're announcing tonight? Well, uh, let me start on this. This is a complicated question. When we initiated the pause, there were several reasons. One was we didn't know how many cases were out there. Could there have been many cases that had not been reported that we didn't know about? And second of all, there was a risk window where a lot of people had recently been vaccinated and we didn't know whether the, how many people would actually be developing this syndrome. And we also didn't know how many practitioners would actually know how to recognize and report and appropriately treat this. So those were the reasons that went into the pause. As we went through the last days since the pause, we've received a great deal of information that is reassuring. Number one, our reporting system was working and we didn't get a huge number of increased reports. Um, Second of all, uh, as uh, Dr. Walensky said, the people who had been more recently diagnosed with this syndrome actually didn't get heparin and were appropriately man were managed in a way that um, showed that practitioners were getting the message about what this syndrome was. So as we did this intensive a scientific evaluation over the recent days, I think we became more and more confident about the decision that was made today. Does anyone else on the panel want to add to that? I, maybe we'll just say that there were 15 uh, people in the ACIP panel and there was unanimity to, to move forward and to move forward in, with everyone. Thank you. Our next question comes from David Lim at Politico. Please turn your camera on and unmute yourself. Hi, um, thanks for taking the question. Um, average Americans are probably not likely to read a revised fact sheet or emergency use authorization document. Given the concerns that were raised at the ACIP meeting, what steps are FDA and CDC taking to ensure consumers, especially young women, are properly informed of the potential risk of the rare side effect, especially at locations where there's a high throughput of vaccinations with limited opportunity to have in-depth conversations? Well, to begin with, we do uh, give out a fact sheet written in lay language to people um, either before they come to the vaccination site or when they uh, get to the vaccination site but I will turn it over to the CDC more on uh, education. Yeah, I, one of the things I think we've done over the last week ex is extraordinary outreach to providers, to clinicians, to public health officials, to make sure that everybody sort of knew about the syndrome and was able to, um, to be informed, to refer patients, um, to have this discussion. I think just even as discussions of vaccine confidence, you understand that people are listening to the lay media, they're, they're listening to the press. We need to do that and continue to do that. We already have plans to do more of that. Um, and, you know, we've done a lot of outreach, especially with providers um, of young women uh, the uh, uh, American College of OBGYN to sort of talk to the providers who are providing care to these patients. Um, there was a, a robust discussion about um, where and how to inform uh, patients and, and consumers of the vaccine and uh, the risk and benefit of at lack of access if we made it harder um, versus um, ensuring inf information and, and we're committed to ensuring the information. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mike Stoby from Associated Press. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for taking the question. I, I uh, wanted to ask you a, a little bit more about the timing. You all said that um, the vaccine, these vaccinations with the J and J vaccine can begin almost immediately tomorrow morning. You also talked about uh, the need to inform women of the risk. Uh, there's going to be inserts, but uh, the 
commencement is happening before the warning, isn't it? Was there an internal discussion about should we hold the pause a couple of days until the materials can appear in the insert or um, the, the fact sheets can be updated or the outreach? Do, do you mind talking a little bit more about that and, and how you're going to get that warning out uh, just as fast as you're getting the shot down? Dr. Marks, you want to discuss yeah, thanks that? Thanks very much. So, um, Given that we've had very good dialogue with our colleagues at, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and that we've been thinking about this, uh, we had been anticipating various outcomes uh, and uh, over the course of the past few days had put together revised uh, fact sheets both for the providers and for patients. Those fact sheets are now actually approved and out there. Um, uh, that's the beautiful thing about the electronic world and, and printing on demand. Uh, so those are available uh, for use immediately uh, in informing patients and providers. And the uh, inserts and the uh, other materials for patients. Uh, that's, that's what patient, Dr. That's, Marks that's was talking patient, about. That's that's the patient the, their, the patient information sheet is a part of the emergency use authorization package that's given to the patient and that's been revised. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from Erica Edwards at NBC. Please turn your camera on and unmute yourself. Hi, I think I got it. Um, I was curious if you have anything more about treatments. Um, can this be treated early? Uh, if Can this be treated successfully if caught early? And are you still recommending alternative blood thinners um, other than heparin, as well as IVIG? I'll refer that to Dr. Marks. Thanks very much for that question. So um, based on the experience, these are obviously very rare events, but based on the experience that um, experts have had managing this, the recommendation is not to use heparin. Um, though we don't know exactly how uh, much heparin can cause harm here, we feel it's best not to use that. And there are other anticoagulants available, so we're recommending other anticoagulants and uh, the use of immune globulin because that appears to reverse this process, uh, at least in a number of the people who received it. So that combination is what is being recommended at this time. Thank you. Our next question comes from Meg Terrell from CNBC. Please turn your camera on and unmute yourself. Hi, um, I'm going to uh, ask your apologies for a, a quick two parter if I could. Um, the first is I know that Johnson and Johnson paused um, its trials uh, while this pause was going on as well. Do you expect that this guidance should also apply to trials uh, in adolescents, for example? And then my my part B, if you don't mind, is just about um, emergency use authorization in general and how the balance of how you consider future vaccines changes as we have these three vaccines available um, as we are waiting for AstraZeneca to potentially file. Um, are there, does, does the bar kind of for whether a vaccine should have emergency use authorization change when there are three other vaccines already out there? Thanks. I'll have Dr. Marks answer the first question, and I, I'm not sure uh, we can give you a lot of information about the second question, right? Obviously, emergency use is uh, the benefits outweigh the known and suspected, the potential benefits outweigh the known and suspected risks. So that is a dynamic situation. But Dr. Marks? Uh, th thanks very much for that question. So. Um, the, the pause in the enrollment uh, to the uh, Johnson & Johnson or Janssen trials was something that was undertaken voluntarily by the company. From our perspective at this point, um, we, have, we won't have any objection with them uh, restarting their trials, and that's ultimately um, up to them. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from Angelica Levito from Bloomberg. Please turn your camera on and unmute yourself. Hi. 
sorry, should women but under the age of 50 take a different vaccine? Anyone like to um, address that question? I think that there are numerous factors that people uh, have to take into consideration when when addressing when considering which vaccine is right for them. Some people um, want a one and done. Some people will not have access to another vaccine in the near future. Um, and I think that this risk trade off is one that people have to individually um, individually measure for themselves. We invite people to talk to their physicians if, or to talk to their health departments if they don't have physicians, but. Um, what we are saying is that this should be certainly an option for women in that age uh, category um, as one of the many, uh, as one of the three vaccines that would be available to them, safely available to them for, um, for use. Thank you. And our last question for the evening comes from Julie from Reuters. So please turn your camera on and unmute yourself. Sorry about that, I was having some technical difficulties. Uh, um, so Dr. Marks, um, when you uh, were originally talking about this investigation, you talked about looking at the possibility of this being a class effect because the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine are both adenoviral vector vaccines. There are, there are some differences too. What is the what, what studies are you doing to understand the mechanism behind these blood clots and have you made any progress in um, identifying whether or not there are any particular risks among the women who get these or, or uh, among individuals who get these blood clots? Thanks. Yes. Th th thanks, thanks very much. I, they're, they're excellent questions. Obviously, it's early days in trying to understand the scientific region, reason for these clots. Um, but let me just take something back a step. To a person looking at these, the clots that are being seen, and the blood platelets that are being seen uh, with the AstraZeneca vaccine and, and the Janssen vaccine, they resemble each other so that a clinician would not, if they were seeing someone, they wouldn't know which vaccine they received. So it looks to be the same type of syndrome. Uh, we don't know that absolutely, but uh, it's very likely. And so a variety of, uh, of different investigations are either underway or planned to look at whether there are associations, for instance, with the, uh, the immune background, the HLA type of individuals, et cetera. We don't know that there's a connection yet, um, but because there would seem to be perhaps differences um, in different populations in the incidents, that's something that has to be investigated. So I suspect in the next couple of weeks, there'll be a lot of scientific work by both academics, government, uh, to try to understand this. Um, and, and that will hopefully bring us um, uh, some more uh, information about um, why this is uh, occurring. I would like to add, I and in terms of one of your, your other questions there, just to, to finish it up, I think mm -hmm. we don't see any clear association at this right. point with uh, the oral contraceptive right. or any one of the typical um, risks that some people have for blood clotting. There are certain uh, conditions that increase one's risks uh, for uh, blood clots based on a genetic uh, predisposition, and we don't see any clear uh, association with that. Good. Thanks for that question. Okay, uh, thank you all for joining us today for this virtual press conference. This concludes the press conference. A replay will be available on the FDA's YouTube page. Thank you and goodbye. You're watching Crown On. We'll have more news for you coming up after the break.